Now, the Three Martini Lunch with Greg Columbus and Jim Garrity. And welcome, everyone, to the Tuesday edition of the Three Martini Lunch, along with Jim Garrity of National Review. I'm Greg Corumbus of Radio America. Good, bad, and crazy martinis for conservatives today, as usual. Jim, we're just hours away from seeing who makes the adult table at the Thursday debate, the first of uh, quite a few, actually, of the Republican field in 2016. We should also point out that today is President Obama's birthday, and our gift to him is that we're not talking about him very much today. <laughs> Uh, the nicest thing we could think of. Yeah, exactly. Uh, but we are talking about uh, Hillary Clinton here in the Good Martini. And for the second day in a row, our Good Martini is a poll. This one from the Wall Street Journal and NBC News. And the numbers just keep getting worse for Hillary Clinton. And now the focus is on how bad they're getting among female voters. In June, 44% of white women had a favorable view of Mrs. Clinton compared to 43% who did not. In July, those numbers moved in the wrong direction for Mrs. Clinton. Only 34% of white women saw her in a positive light, compared to 53% who had a negative impression of her. Among black women, it's still pretty positive towards Mrs. Clinton. Those numbers have also uh, dipped uh, quite a bit. In June, it was an 81-3 to margin. Now it's 66-15, to so that's got some Democratic analysts fearing there might not be a very motivated turnout among black Americans next year. And Jim, all of this comes while uh, the media and the Obama administration seem to be drooling at the prospect of a Joe Biden presidential run. Not exactly the best week for Hillary. Yeah, I think this is the first hit the panic button numbers we've seen for Hillary in this cycle. And, you know, for those of us who look at her explanations for her private server and whether there was classified information in it or not, spoiler alert, yes, there was. <laughs> uh, the working with Sid Blumenthal, the rather implausible answers given in the interview with CNN, the relative unavailability from the press. We look at her answers on this and find them kind of laughable and implausible. Never mind whether we, we agree with her, never even whether they're honest they're, they're, or they're lies. They're bad lies. <laughs> they're not particularly plausible lies. It's finally catching up with her. I, and I think that ultimately, again, We've been saying this from the beginning. She's seen as yesterday's news. She's been in the news and famous since 1992. I think there's kind of a collective burden to this. And in as much as um, people might think, ah, you know, it's early, it's summer, the year before a presidential election year, I, I think maybe with the, the as political news revolving around Hillary and the other Republican candidates begins to dominate the news, people are thinking a little more seriously, including Democrats. And that's why there was this sudden burst of, oh, oh wait, what about Joe Biden? Hmm. Now, that I think there's a lot of Democrats who ultimately don't like having a choice foisted upon them, handed down from on high. This is who your nominee is going to be. So you have, uh, you know, obviously the excitement for Bernie Sanders before, and now there's kind of buzz around Joe Biden. You know, Hillary is a candidate who has walked into this race pretty much thinking she had her party locked up and all these demographics locked up. And um, this is not the ideal candidate to keep the Obama coalition uh, together and, and all marching in the same direction. Jim, it's kind of interesting, if, especially if you watch the Josh Earnest comments from yesterday. He almost seemed positively giddy about the prospect of a, a Biden run. So it's pretty obvious that there's still this rift between the Obamas and the Clintons, despite Hillary serving in the Obama administration. And as long as that's obvious, and since the media chose Team Obama eight years ago, mm -hmm. do you think they have an instinct to do so again, even if it's not Obama on the ballot this time? Yeah. Again, on the one hand, I'm sure people feel like Hillary was a loyal servant during the first term of Obama's presidency. Um, and you wouldn't see any of them speaking that critically of her time as secretary of state or anything like that. But keep in mind, look, oh, Biden has been there. And, and you and I have discussed that as much, you know, he comes across as the national crazy uncle. Um, and I am sure that, you know, Josh Earnest and everybody else in that White House still interacts with Joe Biden on a regular basis. And they probably tell him to stop eating the wax fruit that's out there for display. And, you know. <laughs> I'm sure we've all seen the picture of him looking out the window and all the crazy <laughs> captions people can be. In a strange way, Joe Biden generates a lot more warmth and a lot more affection amongst your rank and file Democrats than Hillary Clinton does. And he's not a symbol. He's not playing the victim card. He's not there because he's, you know, he's you know, he's been a loyal yes sir man for for Barack Obama for 7 years, and I think a lot of, you know, Democrats respect that and appreciate that. If he does jump in, it'll be kind of fascinating because I have a feeling he's a lot, you know, in some ways, you know, he, he's crazy like a fox. There's a certain, I think there's a certain toughness to him that, that people forget about. And I think that if he ever goes after Hillary, uh, it could be absolutely fascinating to watch because I think she does have this glass jaw. And uh, all he's got to do is imply that, you know, he told us you had Benghazi nailed down that night. 
<laughs> or something <laughs> like that. And that's the end of Hillary's campaign right then and there. Yeah, that could be very, very interesting. And uh, I, I just want to see the Democratic debates. They keep pushing them back. But that's another story for another time. On to the bad martini. And as we glumly suspected, uh, the U.S. Senate failed to get to the 60 vote threshold on Monday night to move along legislation that would defund Planned Parenthood. 60 votes were needed to advance and break the filibuster. In the end, there were only 53 uh, votes against uh, 46 who wanted to keep funding. The numbers really should have been 54-45 because Senate Majority Leader Mitch McConnell switched his vote from yes to no so he could bring it back up at another time if the opportunity presents itself. If you're doing the math, uh, Lindsey Graham decided that campaigning in New Hampshire was more important than being in the Senate for this vote. So, Jim, not only those factors uh, are bad that the vote didn't pass, but given what we saw in those videos, it's hard to imagine, unless there's even worse things coming out in the subsequent videos, what's it going to take to defund these people who are harvesting baby organs and selling them? Yeah, I don't necessarily want to whack Lindsey Graham around like a pinata, but on the other hand, was it really that important to be there in person for the forum last night? Rubio, Rand Paul, Ted Cruz all did it from Washington. The remote worked fine. I'm sure these guys would have preferred to be there in person. It's a little bit tougher to do a uh, to connect with an audience when you're just an image on a screen. But all in all, it just looked very strange for Lindsey Graham to prioritize being in person at this forum to that vote. And uh, and Lindsey Graham's a relatively pro-life guy, so so it just seems like an odd choice on his part. Um, you can't blame him for it not, you know, for them not having the required number of votes. They fell several votes short, but it just looked um, like candidate Graham overrode Senator Graham on that one. I don't think it worked very well. We'll see what else the Center for Medical Progress has and whether other opportunities will uh, present itself. Uh, obviously, we've got the appropriations fight coming, and that could get interesting depending on who wants to do what related to Planned Parenthood. All right, on to the third martini now, the crazy one. And, uh, Jim, the illegal immigration question keeps coming up in a number of different ways. It certainly impacted the Republican presidential debate in significant ways already, and we're just getting started. But last night in Huntington Park, it went to a new level about the role that illegal or undocumented Americans play in their local community. Here's a political reporter, Dave Bryan from KCAL 9 TV. The city of Huntington Park is overwhelmingly Latino, as are several cities in this region, most of whom are legal American citizens, some of whom are not. Now, those officials here at City Hall are saying the second group deserves a voice here in Huntington Park as well. And two commissioners, undocumented immigrants, are being appointed to commissions. So they've been added to the uh, city commission, I guess in an advisory role where they don't actually vote on policy, uh, Jim. But if you're interested in the rule of law, this clearly sends a very bad message. Yeah. And I think ultimately one of the great complications in the de immigration debate is that there is a significant number of Americans who really believe that there should not be immigration laws. It was that old uh, Wall Street Journal uh, editorial board uh, opening statement, there should be open borders. These two people, they may be the nicest people in the whole wide world, but they are in violation of the law. Um, apparently, some folks at that city council meeting were pretty darn irked because they were saying, look, these are personal friends who worked on the uh, mayor's campaign. It's interesting they're doing this in California not too long after this incident with the sanctuary city up in, in, Cal in San Francisco. Whether or not you believe these people need to be deported immediately or something like that, to basically say, oh, no, we're going to put these on these houses. They're not going to get paid, uh, thankfully. But uh, basically this is saying, you know, no, you're here. We're going to treat you just like everybody else. And if you believe we're going to, you know, like we're going to treat illegal immigrants the exact same way we treat legal immigrants and U.S. citizens, then ultimately you don't have an immigration law. I'm rather baffled to see how many people just kind of think that this this type of this area of law is optional and that a place like Huntington Park can basically say, no, we're, we're not going to uh, we're not just becoming a sanctuary city. We're basically becoming an illegal immigrant celebration city, taking it even further. And, and you know, this this kind of reeks of uh, politics and, and a rather cynical effort to win over a group that is here in violation of the law. Two quick follow-up points here, Jim. First of all, we saw it, obviously, with the way that the left uh, uses terms related to the abortion debate in Planned Parenthood. Now it's undocumented immigrant, a, a term they've used for a long time. How badly are we on the right losing uh, the word game on these issues, and how big of a setback is that for us as we try to debate these things? I'm a little bit skeptical of the the Frank Luntz and, and who is somebody on the Democratic side who believe, you know, don't wrote, don't think of an elephant, this idea that there's some sort of, you know, hypnotic value in using the right words. I, I do think, however, that when you insist that it's, you know, I, when people object to the term illegal immigrant, I get irked by that because it is accurate. 
They are immigrants and they are here illegally. Um, I've heard some people say they don't like the term illegal aliens because it makes people think of little green men and things like that. Okay, fine. Undocumented immigrants makes you think, oh, it's a paperwork issue. You know, they, they, you know, something got filed the wrong place. No, no. They came here in violation of the law. This is not a matter of, you know, misfiling or something like that. And then kind of the third angle that kind of just jumps out about that is periodically the, the theme that's coming over, you know, um, Caitlyn Jenner is a woman and uh, Hillary is dead broke and things like that, that the left is at war with language. They are at, lo- they are at war with words meaning what they're supposed to mean. Um, someone who comes into this country without permission is illegal. And the idea of trying to banish that from the language is indeed an attempt to redefine what someone is by redefining the word that applies to it. And, and I can understand that. On the other hand, I don't think that necessarily the numbers are on the you know, immigration issue because of the words that uh, certain folks in the media use. One last point in the video footage of this meeting in Huntington Park, there's a phrase on the wall behind the city council or city commission members where there is no vision, the people perish. Jim, <laughs> they might want to turn around and look at that every once in a while there. Oh, they have a vision. <laughs> they have a vision. We just don't like it. Ultimately, there are people who believe that letting in as many immigrants as possible will be to their political benefit. And any side consequences to the economy, any side consequences to social harmony, any consequences for assimilation, uh, the balkanization of America, you know, that's, that's all irrelevant because it gets them more votes. And, and that short-sighted mentality, I think, is really what we're battling because it, it completely puts the partisan and personal interest way ahead of the national interest. On that sobering note, we'll leave it for today. Like we said, we'll know the top 10 later today, and we'll probably mention that a little bit tomorrow. So, Jim, have a great day, and talk to you on Wednesday. See you Wednesday, Greg. Jim Garrity of National Review. I'm Greg Corumbus of Radio America. Thanks for being with us today, and tune in again Wednesday for the next Three Martini Lunch.